Dr. Shaman sir, I think uh, now we are live, so it's a good time to mention that uh, today actually marks uh, to all our delegates who have joined. Uh, uh, more will be joining soon. It is, uh, I think, a very good time to remember that this is, in fact, the 12th episode of our adherence series that we are having all through the year. And we are so fortunate to have had not one, but many, uh, but more 11, uh, after, even uh, before today, 11 great sessions with multiple speakers. And all the recordings are available on YouTube. So, and the link. So, if anyone wants to, uh, you know, access those programs or listen to that, they can uh, just check out, check the links or go to our YouTube channel with the same name, I know, okay. So, uh, Dr. Samantha. Yeah. So, good evening, everyone. And a very good morning to Vedantan, sir, who is from US, University of Colorado. So we are very sorry that we are now disturbing you in the middle of your breakfast. So welcome you, sir. And today's topic is allergen immunotherapy and adherence. And for that, we have chairpersons from their, uh, the, the very renowned chairpersons, Professor Shantanu Kumar Tripathi, who is a noted and very senior clinical pharmacologist in the country. We have Dr. Orijit Das, who is a senior allergist in this part of India, Eastern India, who, who is practicing allergen immunotherapy since 1986. And he, he is now the director of Allergy Asthma Treatment Center in Kolkata. So welcome you, sir. And we also have Dr. Oshim Sharkar, who is a very renowned dermatology consultant. And also, he is now the visiting at Sagar Dotto Medical College, Kolkata, GD Hospital, and different other hospitals in the city. So we are really privileged to have Dr. Oshim Sharkar also in this podium. And it is my my, uh, I think Dr. Vedantan sir's video is not yet started. Uh, sir, you have to start your video by your own, sir. I think there is some issue. Oh, should I go back and come? Uh, uh, let me see. Please try once to start your video. The, the first host has. It says host has stopped your video. I don't. Let me, because you are also the co-host. Sorry. Yeah, I think uh, the video option is showing here. It is open, but most probably there is some uh, default change happened in your computer or like that. Should that I is... go back and come? Yes, sir. Once you please try. Okay. Sir, could you try putting the video on now once please? Should I put the video on now? Okay. Yes, sir. Could you just try them? Thank you. <clears throat> no, I think I think there is some issue. Issue happened. Yes. It says uh, video surface camera front. That's what is on. Select a camera. Should I disconnect and come back again? Okay, yes, sir. sir. I think that would be good. Okay. So, one of the most important part of to get the success in allergen immunotherapy is adherence. And uh, we are really fortunate that Inovocare Health Soft Solution give us the opportunity to address this very important issue, adherence and allergen immunotherapy. But what is important that is selecting the right candidate for allergen immunotherapy, which is very, very essential to get success. And for that, we have professor of professors because uh, Professor P.K. Vedantan is a very, very 
uh, renowned person in the in internationally he is a renowned allergist and we are really proud and privileged to have dr vedantan sir and let me yeah so he will tell us about the how to select the right candidate for allergen immunotherapy generally the practical considerations so may i request vedantan sir to please present uh, the your topic sir thank you dr shambha i think uh, there is some issue from your uh, uh, I, laptop and that is why it is not opening yet it's okay we can okay, proceed sir. so it won't delay your uh, yes, meeting sir. Okay, sir. Okay, proceedings sir. Okay. and good evening to you all thank you once again for your kind introduction dr shambha and uh, i'm glad you are doing this uh, periodic meeting i did not know until just i got an invite from you recently so this is a good uh, platform for uh, educating not only fellow allergy specialists but also but also the general physicians pediatricians like that so the topic selected today is a hot topic <clears throat> so i am going to go through fairly fast and uh, try to confine myself to the part of the portion of the allergen immunotherapy topic that has been assigned to me because it's a huge topic so let me go ahead and share my screen now can you hear dr shambha yes sir we can hear you sir but yeah screen is okay don't you don't have to even if you don't see me if you see the slides more important okay yes sir we can see, see your uh, okay. slides yeah okay so the topic assigned to me was patient selection on allergen immunotherapy before we go to that particular topic just let's go through a few things first of all a little bit of history allergy is a very old disease it was actually noted around 2500 bc when a egyptian pharaoh manas he died of a wasp sting so they knew there is something external causing this mortality suddenly like that so they noticed it that there was something from outside nothing nothing to do with the pharaoh himself and this sort of observation was very interesting but nothing happened and there were several uh, scientists who worked on this particular um, issue for a while and allergen immunotherapy was was sort of uh, being practiced for the little more than 100 years and it was successful otherwise things would not just go on like that nobody is going to use something which is totally useless so it was helping patient so it was being continued but without knowing the mechanism that is the whole issue we were treating patients without knowing what mechanism how is it working we don't know until in 1968 we came for the first time to know that there is a a very close connection there is a marriage between immunology and allergy ige was discovered both in denver and sweden and independently in 1968 and that was a breakthrough to say that allergy is an immunological disease ige is a very important component so we need to look at ige and that is how this lot of progress have been made in allergy immunotherapy only recently in the past two and a half three decades we know how it is working how effective it is how it is facilitating the improvement of the allergic diseases what are the limitations what are the indications what are the limitations so all these things we come to know only recently now the target is basically allergic type of disease allergic asthma allergic rhinitis and foods recently and sometimes allergic conjunctivitis so this is an issue that we need to know that you are going to target only allergic problem because there are several phenotypes of asthma there are different phenotypes of allergic rhinitis also of rhinitis also and 
Allergen immunotherapy is the only powerful proven immunomodulator. That is, this is the only entity, therapeutic entity, which can modify the disease. It can change the course of the disease. It can change the character of the disease from allergic to non-allergic. That is from TH2 to TH2 pathway, which is the allergic pathway towards TH1 pathway through the help of the uh, different cells. So the most important cell that is involved in allergic reaction is not the eosinophil. It is not the mast cell. It is the T lymphocyte. It is a T lymphocyte. So allergy is a T cell driven disease. This is something you need to be very clear. And T cell is the one that drives the whole reaction. And Fortunately, allergen immunotherapy works on the T cell. This is the only modality that works on the T cell. No pharmacotherapy works. And it has been shown and has been used successfully recent years on, in, uh, by oncologists in cancer immunotherapy, again, working on the T cell. So how do you select patients for allergen immunotherapy? The three most important criteria for patient selection for this very powerful treatment is history, history, history. So the history is the most important portion of the evaluation to decide whether a patient needs immunotherapy or not. It is not any type of test. So the history is the most important criteria. So as an allergist, you are already trained to do a good history. So you should do a better history when you suspect uh, somebody who may benefit from immunotherapy. When I say better history, that means we have what we call as a second history. After the patient is evaluated, that means hey, you have taken the history physical, you have done the skin test, you have the lab in front of you. You call the patient and take the second history. Some people call it as a summary conference. And that is the time when you want to correlate the findings together. That is correlating the history with the skin test findings, correlating the history with your immunocap results. So that is called second history, which is a very important portion of the allergic evaluation. Why did allergic immunotherapy had a bad repute, uh, repute in the past several years? You know, uh, many of our colleagues were saying, oh, he's a shot doctor. He puts everybody on shots, so don't go to him. So that was not uncommon. It is still there. And it is our duty to educate our peers, other physicians, that allergen immunotherapy is a evidence-based approach towards treatment of allergic diseases. So you should make it a point to do more CMEs for generalists, not just allergists, generalists your own colleagues in your institutions to educate them about immunotherapy because still many people do not know everything about allergen immunotherapy and there is plenty of literature to support it. And the main reasons why it had a bad repute was these, the selection of patients was poor, selection of antigens was poor, the knowledge of prescribing, how to write a prescription was also poor. So these were the main three main reasons why allergen immunotherapy had a bad repute. So what is the right way to do it? The right way is proper patient selection. Very, very crucial. You should know, you should have an idea how to figure out this patient is a candidate for immunotherapy. This patient is not a candidate for immunotherapy. This patient might be a candidate for immunotherapy down the future. So these are all issues that you need to have. And these are not laboratory decisions. These are what we call as clinical decisions. So you need clinical acumen to decide who goes on immunotherapy. <laughs> because in front of you, you will have skin tests. <clears throat> so it's very easy to treat uh, skin test, that is what unfortunately is being done by remote allergy practitioners, where the remote allergy practitioners who just do the test with immunocap or skin test and then start immunotherapy based upon skin test results, and that is totally fallacious. <clears throat> it is almost unethical because you don't know the patient's history at all. This is being done even in the United States. So important point is treat the patient, do not treat skin tests or immunocap. So 
points to be considered when we think about allergy and immunotherapy is does this patient have a strong history? When you say strong, does this patient have symptoms that are suggestive of a mast cell released uh, Ig re really uh, Ig mediated reaction through mast cell? Does this patient have significant itching? Does he have rhinorrhea? Does he have sneezing? Does he have wheezing? Is there a time relationship? Is there a correlation of his symptoms with his environment? Is these symptoms are seasonal? Are they really bothersome? Are they interfering with his lifestyle? Is it progressive? That means the allergic symptoms progress over a period of time. They keep on recurring and progress. You need to know allergy is a 24 seven disease. It is not a disease that is only occurring in the mornings or in the evenings. It is occurring all the time, 365 days, just like any other diseases. And when it is occurring like that, it is not a disease that is just remaining stable. It is progressing daily. It is immuno there are two types of progression. One is clinical progression, another is immunological progression. If you do skin testing today, and three months later you do the same antigen, same patient, same site, you will see changes. That is not your mistake or anything, it is called immunological progression. Skin testing getting bigger, the shape and size getting bigger are different, and the intensity of the reaction is different. So and the patient is having more and more symptoms. The medications are not, not working as good as before. These are subtle signs. There is no guideline for this. There is nothing like that written in your books about it. So these are things you learn at the bedside, at the patient's consultation room. That is, these are subtle things. And this is the science of progression. You should learn that art of defining or identifying the progressive allergic disease. So an ideal patient for allergic immunotherapy is not a patient who is very old, is not a patient with an established long-term disease. This is a patient who is young, where the disease is young. So you need to catch people when the disease is still very mild or, very, uh, or moderate to some extent and where the symptoms are changing. Say like you have an allergic rhinitis patient, a six-year-old, classical, but he seems to cough at night. But other than that, he has no symptoms or he coughs when he is having some physical activity when he runs at school. Parents may not even know it. So you have to ask the patient. What happens when you play at school? What happens? I start coughing, but doesn't bother me. But that is a sign of progression. So lung functions may not show it, but still it's a clinical sign that there may be some progression. That doesn't mean you start immunotherapy on him, but you note that there is some clinical progression. And these patients are patients who are seeing you every day, these are, I mean, quite often, these are patients which are being missed out by general pediatricians, by general doctors, because they do not recognize the progression of the allergic disease. They keep on prescribing antihistamines, anti-allergic medication, and they tell the patient you are going to outgrow it, which is totally in, uh, false. You will never outgrow allergic disease. Allergic disease is an immunological disease. The immune system will not just forget and keep quiet. It will continue to bother you. It will continue to progress. By the age 50 or 60, it will get better on its own, but not until then. <clears throat> so important thing is catching it early, catching the patient early, as well as being selective. Yeah. And about foods, I will tell you a little bit about that. Now there has been immunotherapy, oral immunotherapy, and this is a very, actually a very new procedure and a risky procedure. So do not feel too freely with oral immunotherapy. You use it only for selective patients where the aim is to protecting from accidental ingestions only, not for regular ingestion of that particular food. I have seen people who say I have been uh, allergic to now milk and now I'm taking two cups of milk, but doctor desensitized me, that is not, desensitization. Oral immunotherapy is a very selective, highly, um, uh, what do you say, a little risky procedure that has got very clear 
few indications that is to prevent accidental ingestions. That is, for example, somebody goes to a party and has a chocolate with some peanuts, the allergic immunotherapy will protect him. But no, somebody who's allergic to peanuts will not routinely go and take peanuts on his own because he's afraid of peanuts. Now, is this an acceptable place for immunotherapy in the GINA guidelines? GINA guidelines have prescribed immunotherapy for the first time in 2021, only for adults and adolescents 12 plus years. And is this accept acceptable? At least this is a good thing. It is a thing that is happening on the positive side. For the first time, we have recognized that immunotherapy has a place along with all the other pharmacotherapeutic agents. Is, is it acceptable completely? My answer is no, because it is too late. It's too little. You need to start immunotherapy before the disease becomes established. You need to start it at the very early subtle signs, even before the tests show it. So this inclusion is a good thing, but not enough is my conclusion. So summary slide, history is the most important criteria for deciding. A young patient with a young disease is the ideal candidate bad selection of antigens, bad selection of patients have led to bad repute. And you always should know allergic immunotherapy is a very powerful armamentarium. It actually starts from, it starts working from day one. It doesn't take six months to know it. Clinically, it may, you may take a few months to notice it, but immunologically, it starts working from day one, just like any other medication. Now, what is progression? I like that word progression because people in our training programs are always asked about, what do you mean by progression? Progression is when there is a frequency, increase in the frequency of symptoms. Mother says, you know, my child used to have problems only a couple of times a week, but now he's having daily symptoms. He's having some sneezing and coughing every day in the morning. It, it did not happen six months ago, and that is progression. And his, his need for medication is increasing and he's not responding to as well as medication he used to. And it doesn't bother me, but you know, he's not too bad, but uh, he, I have to just give the medicines every day. If I miss it one day, he is having a recurrence of symptoms. So these are subtle things. These are mentioned very casually by the parent to you or by the patient to you. And you have to take it seriously because this is a sign of progression. If you don't catch these clinical pearls, the clues that are given by the patient or by the family, you are going to miss it. And the disease will keep on progressing to asthma very fast. Because in our study done in, uh, in Mysore published in 2009 is a little bit old, what it showed, was there were three groups of patients, but when we followed these patients with allergic rhinitis alone, 70% of these patients developed asthma within one year. And that is very disturbing, but that doesn't happen everywhere. We are a tertiary care, so we are getting patients who have been to other doctors before and is not responding. So they have come at a stage where the disease has progressed to an extent where it can just shift to the next stage very fast. And so this particular population, the, the progression was happening very, very fast. So when you have progression or when things are sort of moving towards it, the only treatment that can modify that natural course is allergen immunotherapy. Inhaled steroids will not do it, antihistamines will not do it, antileukotrines will not do it, environmental control will not do it. It is allergy immunotherapy because that's the only thing that works on the T cell and none of the other modalities that we use works on the T cell. So it prevents progression from allergic rhinitis to allergic asthma. If you have one allergy to few things and then you increase more and more without um, uh, as progression, that is uh, what we call as neosensitization. You develop newer allergies all the time. That is immunological progression that is also only responsive to allergen immunotherapy, not to any type of pharmacotherapy. The reason being it is T cell driven. No medications work on the T cell. And there are ways you can select patients with the molecular selection, they call it. It is more at the research basis and certain labs do it. Clinically speaking in your office, 
you may not be able to do it on all patients. It's basically a ratio between your IG, serum IG level, specific IG level and the IgG4. If the ratio is uh, high, is low, which is that may, if it is high, sorry, because the numerator is IgE, denominator IgG4. And if the IgG4, which is a protective antibody is low, the numerator and the numerator is IgE, specific IgE, the product, the result will be a higher figure. So as the IgG4 goes up, uh, your, uh, the, the figure comes down. So a high, lower figure is a good sign, higher figure in the ratio is not a good sign. And it seems to correlate with negative skin test. So, Summary slide again is you do not have to start immunotherapy at the first visit. Give some time. You suspect that this patient may be a candidate. So discuss with the patient. The reason for that is patients need time. Family needs time to decide on it. It is not a thing that you like. It is not like taking antihistamines for a few weeks or months. It is not like taking antibiotics for 10 days. This is a treatment that will go on for the next five years or longer. So the family needs to think. Generally, you say this is a thing that my, this immunotherapy is a good thing for your child. Think about it. I'm giving you all this information. Please read through it. Come and see me whenever you feel like, and we will discuss more. So give some time and then decide. And when does it work? When you do patient proper patient selection, properly done skin test, when you're using reliable antigens and you're trying to correlate everything and you're using the proper IT materials, you're writing the prescriptions properly and you're also developing patient compliance. When none of these are there, it will not work. And inappropriate uses are when the symptoms are very few and brief, say like somebody has symptoms for three weeks in a year, you don't want to start them on immunotherapy. You may even do skin testing and find he's highly allergic to some regional pollens that occur for three weeks, but though he's not a candidate for immunotherapy, you can manage him unless the season is extending, unless the disease is progressing into developing asthma. A non-compliant asthma, difficulty to understand people, some people have cannot understand this at all or some people have non-specific nasal reactivity. That means it looks like allergy, it's not allergy. Some people who have very unstable asthma or poor PFTs are not candidates. A severe asthma is a contraindication for allergy and immunotherapy, malignancy, any immunological issues, um, immunological diseases are a contraindication because you are trying to treat the immunological immune, immune system. If there is a uh, uh, a disharmonious immune system in that patient, even due to some active autoimmune disease or other malignancy or immunodeficiency, do not start those patients on immunotherapy. So the success depends upon patient selection, antigen selection, good quality antigens, limiting the number. And I will stop here and I'll be happy to answer any questions. I don't know whether I've exceeded my time. Thanks again for your patient hearing. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. So now may I request all the respected delegates, if you have any question, please ask, sir. So, and you can also type the question in the chat box so that we can address those questions to sir. So, uh, let me get uh, the, how do I get this sharing out? Hold on a second. Your screen sharing. Let me stop this, this one. Stop sharing. Yes, sir. So may I request our respected delegates if you have any question. Okay, so Dr. Taha Kureshi. Okay, let me unmute yourself. Uh, Yes, you can ask your question, Dr. Kureshi. Sir, uh, thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, it's always a treat uh, to watch and listen to uh, PK, sir. Uh, good morning, sir. Good morning. Good morning, Taha, Dr. Taha. How are you? Uh, I'm good, sir. I'm good, sir. And I hope you're good, too. Uh, my regards. And just, sir, one question, sir, out of your, uh, you know, a sea of experience in giving allergen immunotherapy to patients. Sir, in your experience, I would uh, love to know 
I mean, what has been uh, the failure rate? Uh, I mean, uh, failure rate, I mean, uh, vis a vis the response. It's a very good question. Allergen immunotherapy doesn't help any everybody. Just yes, like sir. pharmacotherapy doesn't help everybody because we have different phenotypes of the disease, we have different genotypes. That means every one of us is different in handling any type of uh, interventions that you do. In our practices, the immunotherapy seems to work quite well in about 60% and fairly well up till 75%, but 25% of patients do not seem to respond too well. And if the selection is very, very good, you, I can say it probably could go up to around 80s, 80s percent then uh, where it will help quite well. But it depends upon when you start the immunotherapy, how you write the composition. And sometimes the composition may have to be changed because the immunological reactions will be different. It is not the same injections that you started from first week will work also at the 36 weeks. So depending on these patients' response, you may continue, you may change, and you may stop. But when do you stop? When, when do you know the patient is not responding? Is the more yes. practical yes. question. Is right. Some people say six months, I would say one year. If it is not responding in one year, if it is not, he is not at all responding, and you have done everything right, then he, this is a patient where immunotherapy will not work. And you have to look at other alternatives. Right. Thank you. Sir. Thank you so much. One additional point is there are conditions that are allergic, but they look allergic, but not allergic. That means you may have to continue to see these patients on a yearly basis and reevaluate if necessary and do not cancel these patients out completely from the, your practice because they will go to some other doctors because they are not going to stop doctoring. They will continue to look for answers. And sometimes they will get good doctors who will take care of them. Sometimes they may end up in bad hands also. So it is a good idea for you to continue seeing these patients and try to reevaluate if necessary. Any other questions? Yes, sir. There is one question asked by Dr. De Devokruto Shaha. He has asked that immunotherapy also depends upon dominance of allergen, cross-reactivity, compatibility, apart from patient selection. Is not it, sir? Absolutely correct. Because you really have to think about all these. Um, I did not, uh, I could have addressed the selection of antigens because my topic was only selection of subjects. I just uh, limited to that. Selection of antigens is a very, very important portion of the formula. And you need to be very well aware of the cross-reactivity. You also have to know the molecular portion of the antigen, which is going to be antigenically active. So that means what we call as epitope. So you need to be familiar how much to add, how much to how to make up the antigen, because just like antibiotics, we also know we have pharmacotherapeutic uh, information about antigens. We know what is a therapeutic dose for a dust mite, what is a therapeutic dose for pollens. So based, because uh, such knowledge wasn't there before we were, our prescriptions are not very scientific, but now I can write a prescription for immunotherapy, just like I write a prescription for bronchitis or pneumonia with antibiotics, which are standardized and the immunotherapy extracts are also standardized. So you can write very good prescriptions now. Thank you, sir. So may I request Dr. Origi Das if you have any comment? Or we also have Dr. Oshim Sarkar, who is, who is a renowned dermatologist in the city. So may I request, sir, to have your comment if you have anyone, anything? Dr. Oshim Sarkar. Am I audible now? Yeah. Yes, yes. Yes, you are audible. Okay, okay fine. Uh, if there are no more questions, I'd like to ask one to Dr. Vedantan. Sure. Uh, that is, uh, after we have selected patient for immunotherapy and we start the course, 
there's a mild degree of exacerbation in some of them. Not a very large number, but some of them. Over here, you, uh, what I have seen in my past 30 years is if you regulate the doses or bring it down, instead of making it twice, uh, two doses, if you make it four doses, then uh, so what I'm, what I'm trying to get at is if there is a certain amount of flexibility in the dosing schedule, that helps a lot. Absolutely correct. Absolutely correct. Whatever dosages that are suggested in the literature, if textbooks, journals, they're all empirical, you know, go from point 0.1 to point 0.2 to point 0.3 to point 0.5, whatever they are saying, they're all empirical. It is based upon statistics. So statistics okay. does not, you know, patient doesn't know, patient's immune system doesn't know statistics. It will remain, it, it has its own statistics. Right. So your observation, clinical observation is absolutely important and more important than whatever prescri prescribed uh, dosages are. So that is where clinical acumen uh, helps and that is where experience works. So nobody is going to become a good allergist within just because he attends meetings like this. It will take right. clinical practice, seeing hundreds of patients. It will take a few years before you can become a good allergist, clinically oriented allergist. So I, but, uh, I, what I like your question. The guidelines actually propound a fixed dose schedule for everybody. Is that, yes. a, is that a very practical idea? No, actually very, very important because in my own practice, I came out of fellowship. You know, when you come to fellowship in the 70s, you know, I had finished in 70s, I came out of fellowship. When you come out of fellowships, you are almost like a very idealistic approach. I want, they say, oh, the higher you go, the better for the patient to go ahead. I did the same thing. I made my antigens very, very strong. I had six systemic reactions within six months. Right. So, and two of them were physicians, uh, family members. So I learned a lesson badly um, that the same dosage and it, the dosages are terribly individualistic. So some yeah. dosage for person A is not the dosage for person B. So, so you can definitely dilute, you can yeah. reduce the dosage, figure out what is the most safest dose, but therapeutically effective dose for that particular patient. Yes, That's, you can. Thank you very much, because I have been observing this over the last 30 years. So if you yes, yes. If, if we actually customize the dose according to the patient, it works much better than a fixed dose schedule. Absolutely correct. And that is true for a lot of pharmace pharmaceutical agents. Uh, you know, all the dosages that are being uh, prescribed or advised or recommended are all based upon statistical issues. So right. there are patients who will do well with one, one, one dose of uh, inhaled steroid daily also. They don't need two doses. Right. So, right. so it depends. You can. That is why we have step up and step down therapy for asthma, allergies, and that is true for immunotherapy also. Right. Thank you for asking That's that practical wonderful question. Present, Dr. Vedantan. Wonderful. Thank you, sir. Thank okay. you. Also. Um, Thank you, sir, once again for giving us your valuable time, sir. So uh, we have to move to our next topic. Okay. Can I leave now? Can I yes, thank you so much? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay, thank you, sir. Bye bye. So we have our next topic, and let me share the screen as I have to discuss this important issue also ensuring adherence to allergen immunotherapy. Is my screen is visible, Rohan? Yes, it's visible now. Is it full screen? No, not yet. Not yet? Uh, no, in my system, yeah. it's gone now. Cheney is gone now. Now? It is visible. Yeah, now it's full. Yeah. It's full screen. Welcome you, sir. Dr. Ashim Sharkar, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So uh, let's start the topic that is ensuring adherence to allergen immunotherapy. And to discuss this topic, we need to understand the definition as a whole. What is adherence? 
defined by who the extent to which a person's behavior of taking medication following a diet and or executing lifestyle changes that corresponds with a agreed recommendations from a healthcare provider so as if this definition of adherence is meant for a allergen immunotherapy or allergy practice because in each step we understand the importance who are practicing allergology the each word is very important for his or her practice so what is important adherence is not just equal to compliance because in compliance there is no active participation between uh, the active participations from the part of the patient is lacking in the compliance but when we are talking adherence there should be a active participation from the patient side also so patients agreement to the recommendations and they will follow they will act as a active partners with healthcare professionals or their treating physician that is most important for adherence and when we are talking about adherence to allergen immunotherapy we need to understand the real world situation little bit and then how to overcome the difficulties so this is a very good paper on compliance with allergen immunotherapy and factors that affect compliance among the patients with respiratory allergies and it was found that when we are talking about skit that means subcutaneous immunotherapy the compliance rate is little bit higher at around 60% but when we are talking about sleep they had found that it is only around 12% and what is important the initial one month that is almost equal to the skit and sleep but gradually when the time progressed the the compliance decreased in case of sleep and at the end of 36 months that is 3 years we can see the difference that 88 patient in case of sleep and when sleep it is only 10 so we can clearly see the difference between the adherence and what were the reasons for stopping sleep the major concern was about that frequency of injections because we all know about that trypanophobia the fear of injection that is one issue apart from that if the frequency is high we need to give more frequent injections that can cause different types of disturbance in the patient the duration of treatment again that is a concern the commuting and other com commitments were there the waiting time these are less common causes but most important cause to stop skit was frequency of injection and in case of sleep what is important the two i is important number one the inconvenience to sleep the number two is the improvement and poor efficacy so patient feel that i am not improving and there were some data also that sleep is little bit less efficacious than skit and that may be one of the major reason for early stopping of sleep and if we go by different studies done on adherence in skit then we will find the adherence rate throughout different studies is very variable and that comes from 50% to some sometimes highest uh, was in 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 case of that pasno et al study it was around 90% but again we can also see some very poor adherence in some studies that is around 23% and also in case of sleep we can see the adherence rate here little bit we 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 may astonish to see the high numbers here like 85 79 like that but what is important i and what i want to focus here the follow up duration the maximum of 
those studies were very short follow up studies so 6 months one year some studies which was follow up up to 4 year you can see how the adherence rate dropped apart from that the number of the patient study population so as we can see a good number of populations studied by kill at all around more than 3500 they are the adherence rate drop at around 7% so this is a very important issue whereas in case of skit studies you can see they all of those studies were done in a good number of population and the follow up duration was quite high so despite having that high follow up 3 years 5 years 4 years like that their adherence rate was much higher in comparison to uh, slit and this is in nutshell the different types of uh, studies done on skit and slit so what is important the reasons for discontinuation of skit generally due to the safety issues they the safety concerns were fairly relevant to that discontinuation whereas the maximum cases of slit discontinuations were due to that perceived lack of treatment efficacy and apart from that inconvenience was one of the major cause of skid discontinuation cost was a cause and in case of slit also the the inconvenience was some somehow an issue but cost is an again a very important factor for slit also so another important issue as we had faced this covid-19 pandemic and this pandemic changed us a lot and what is the effect of this covid-19 pandemic on the skit adherence there was a study generally what was found the overall compliance rate in the pre covid-19 pandemic was around 86.1% but in during this covid-19 pandemic the dropout was double so initially you can see the dropout was around 14% now it becomes 28.7% pre pre covid-19 pandemic the maximum cause of those dropout was systemic reactions moving to another city like that but after this covid-19 pandemic happened so the maximum causes were due to that fear of being infected with covid-19 and for skit it is sometimes mandatory to visit the physician's office to take the uh, immunotherapy shot so this is an important concerns and we need to address this and another important result for, of that particular study it was a follow up study of around 7 years 8 years like that so what happened the compliance decreased with time that is important the female patients they have a little bit better compliance compared to male patient and if we see the disease specific compliance rate there also the allergic rhinitis have the highest compliance with allergen immunotherapy whereas the asthma patients have less compliance so maybe one of the reason is what professor vedantan had told us that to choose the correct patient as we are failing to choose the correct patient for allergen immunotherapy we are missing many of our patients to be compliant so that is one of the most important issue to identify the correct patient but for adherence this mantra is very important and i think we all should tell our patient that drugs don't work in patient who don't take them and how we can you in enhance that drug taking enhance the adherence there is a simple way what is that simple way we need to simplify the regimen we need to impart knowledge the informed prescribing is very important m means modifying the patient's beliefs and behaviors p for provide communication and trust leave the bias and evaluate adherence 
so to simplifying the regimen we need to adjust the timing frequency amount and dosage of the vaccine so what my uh, dr origi dash was uh, telling that sometimes we need to be personalized while seeing the, uh, writing the dose of the immunotherapy we need to understand from where the patient is coming we need to understand how frequently the patient can come and we need to match that dosage schedule to the patient's activities or some daily living so we can also use some different types of adherence aids like medication boxes alarms but in case of this injectable therapy these are of no use and for drop also these are not that much useful but we can think of different types of use but simplification is why important because this is come from a very old study 1984 it was published in annals of internal medicine that only 36% patient correctly interpreted the meaning of every 6 hours so we need to make them understand simply so this is one case we can see how we can simply tell this patient coming from murshidabad which is a far from kolkata so it is very difficult to come for this particular patient every weekly to us so what we had done we had advised the patients like this you can see the dose of the allergen immunotherapy here and also we asked them not to come every weekly initial 4 weeks she had visited us and take the dose took the dose from our center and understand how to take that in injection then we also followed up with her uh, local physician who can guide her how to take this subcutaneous insulin subcutaneous allergen immunotherapy and what is important in the back page we also written about how what are the alarming sign of anaphylaxis though there is a rare complications of subcutaneous immunotherapy that is anaphylaxis but we need to aware our patient regarding that if happen that anaphylaxis happen how to manage that because that is a life threatening condition and early identification and prompt treatment prompt adrenaline administration can save the patient so that is very important and we can customize this advices from patient to patient next part is imparting knowledge we need to discuss with physician nurse and pharmacist because though we don't have trained pharmacist but it is important if we make awareness regarding this immunotherapy then that can build more compliance more adherence to this particular therapy distribution of written or in information or pamphlets accessing health education information on the web these are very important step and how we these these are few ways by which we can impart knowledge number one limiting instructions to three or four major points during each discussion because it is very difficult if we talk too much use simple everyday language especially when explaining diagnosis and giving instructions not too very sophisticated language is required supplementing oral teaching with written materials when the patient will go back to home they then they can read so we have some templates like that in in this we cannot show this is an english version and we also have some bengali versions also local language versions also so that is written materials are important involvement of the patient's family members and friends that is again important how we can educate them also reinforcing the concept discussed so at the end we need to again reinforce the concept so this is one very interesting study about the knowledge and expectations of patients receiving the aeroallergen immunotherapy 
So this was done with 132 patients. And it was found that the 39% of those patients were expecting complete recovery of the allergies. So that is not true. We should not give them any false belief that this allergen immunotherapy will go, will go to cure you. It is something which is modifying your disease process. The progression of the disease will be altered, but there should not be any false belief that I will be cured. So that can give some bad impression about on this very important tool to treat allergy. Another important aspect was found that one fifth of the study group did not know when improvement should be expected. It is very important to tell them that your improve, you will not improve by after three months or uh, four months like that. It will take time. It will take time, maybe up to six months or one year it will take to actually understand the symptomatic benefit. And why it is important, many of our patients stop taking pharmacotherapy. It is not, we should not stop pharmacotherapy while starting that allergen immunotherapy. So allergen immunotherapy and pharmacotherapy will go hand in hand. Gradually after maybe six months or one year, as per the need, we will de-prescribe de or reduce the dose of pharmacotherapeutics and we can see the progress of the allergen immunotherapy. But what happened? The 18% anticipated improvement to occur within days or weeks from the initiation of treatment. So that is a very wrong notion. We should make them understand because otherwise what happened? They, if they will not feel good after taking allergen immunotherapy, maybe for one month, two months or three months, they will stop taking allergen immunotherapy. We need to tell them from the very first day, this is a long procedure. This requires three to five days, three to five years to get uh, you some benefit. So only 32% were aware that immunotherapy might have some potential risk for adverse effect. And 24.2% failed to identify at least one of the allergens they were receiving. So these are very important. We should be very clear to that patient because though the anaphylaxis is very, very remote possibility, but we need to educate them regarding the possibility of the anaphylaxis, how they can understand the uh, early symptoms of ana anaphylaxis so that they can get the prompt treatment. Next part is the modification of the beliefs and human behavior. So perceive themselves to be at risk due to lack of adoption of healthy behavior. Like in this case, the allergen avoidance, those things are very much required. So we need to make them understand, perceive their medical conditions to be serious, how the allergy, the allergic disease can progress. So this we need to make them understand believe in the positive effects of the suggested treatment, how this therapy is going to modify his disease process, natural history of disease is changed by this allergen immunotherapy. We need to tell them and have channels to address their fears and concerns, perceive themselves as having the requisite skills to perform the healthy behaviors. So it, it, it Again, another study was found that patients recall about 60% of what they have been told and what they recall depends on the salience and time of presentation. The first thing said being most likely to be remembered. So this is why how we should talk with our patient. And I think uh, that that is why that, that this 20 minute time period is also important when we are giving some talk on some specific topic. But I, 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 that is why I, I shall try to finish my presentation with, by another five minutes like that. But it is very important to note that the patient communication is very important part to achieve the optimum therapy. 
and it was found that at least 50% of the patients leave their doctor's office not knowing what they have been told. 50% of psychosocial and psychiatric problems are missed by the physicians due to lack of proper communication. Physicians interrupt patients on an average of 18 seconds into the patient's descriptions of presenting uh, problems. So they interrupt patient by at around 18 seconds. 54% of patients' problems and 45% of the patient concerns are neither elicited by the physician not disclosed by the patient. And 71% of the patients stated poor relationship as a reason for their malpractice claims. So these all are the data from our first world countries like USA. So we need to be very cautious and we don't know what is the data in our country. So we need to improve the patient's communication perspective and that is one of the leading cause of poor compliance in case of allergen immunotherapy. So we need to leave the bias. There is no clear relationship between adherence and race, sex, educational experience, intelligence, marital status, occupational status, income, and ethnic or cultural background. Though there are some studies which suggest that female sex and educational, good educational background can improve more adherence, but again, there are conflicting results. No, the, the, the data are not that much validated. So tailoring the education to patient's level of understanding, that is very important. We need to go to the level of the patient's understanding. And what is important, that individual's level of adherence may vary over time and between different aspects of treatment. So at the initiation of allergen immunotherapy, the individual's level of adherence may be very high. But at the six months, one year, 18 months, two year, this will change. And that we need to understand. We need to see adherence also the individualized way as, as per the time it may change. So these are very important. And lastly, but it is not the least that we need to evaluate again and again the adherence. And for that, we need to believe the self-reporting. Here we have some advantage when we are giving skit because they will put some arrow when taking injection, it's taking shot, but pill counting, not directly possible for sleep because sometimes they uh, the, the, the we cannot just rely on the quantity of the uh, drug, but we can have some indirect measurements by seeing the vials of the allergen immunotherapy, but measuring serum or urine drug levels, that is for other purpose, but for allergen immunotherapy, it is not that much relevant. So effective patient physician communication, we need to improve adherence, the willingness of the patient to share a therapeutic plan, open discussion, that discussion should be a two-way discussion and evaluation of the available options. We need to understand them, why we need something extra called allergen immunotherapy on top of their existing pharmacotherapy, how the atopic march can be re reversed by the allergen immunotherapy, but we should not impose any false belief that with allergen immunotherapy, you will be cured. So the term cure is very wrong and that can give a hell to the allergen immunotherapy concept. So we need to be very extra cautious on that issue. Information about the pros and cons of the treatment modality, we need to understand them about the, some safety issues. There may be some itching, there may be some uh, swelling, but it will be self-filled. So we need to tell each step, each safety concerns of subcutaneous immunotherapy or in case of sublingual immunotherapy, we need to tell them there may be some local irritation while you are taking the drops. So a balanced conversation between the physician and the patient is very important. A dedicated proper amount of time. This time is important. T is very important for improving adherence. 
and lastly but not leastly the adherence end with one letter e and that that is why to improve adherence two e is important one e is education but number two e and most important e is empathy how we talk with our patient that gives something extra boom to the to build the uh, adherence so with that i i again thank you all for keep keeping uh, me uh, for listening so uh, i i want to just uh, thank you sambo this is a very good very good innovating uh, talk uh, thank you professor tripathi if he passes any comment yeah uh, good evening so it was wonderful listening to dr shambo hmm. uh, i'm sorry i joined a little late and uh, i really missed the uh, presentation by dr vedantan but i am sure i have heard dr vedantan earlier it must have been extremely wonderful so but then what dr shambo has said uh, regarding adherence of allergen immunotherapy uh, my comments are most of the time we find that the uh, adherence issues or rather the concerns with the optimum adherence lies more in uh, in this case it is subcutaneous but again although it is injection but uh, unlike uh, intramuscular or intravenous here we are expecting we are uh training the patient how to take the subcutaneous injection and then we would expect that the patient will con will continue to take that by themselves so uh in reality it is as good as oral like in case of oral either uh, because of antigenal problems patient would not uh, like to continue or uh, stop taking similarly here also if the patient is not enough convinced the patient will not uh, continue because it's a long term therapy it's a it's a prolonged therapy and uh, i appreciate that dr sambo also mentioned that uh, just to take the subcutaneous injection if we ask the patient to come back each time to the center uh, that may be uh, too much to expect and then uh, it may be burdensome to the patient and then it's better to explain to the patient and uh, better to also rope in a local physician maybe patients uh, a uh, private physician uh, in the loop so that uh, uh, in case there is any kind of uh, questions query that can be addressed by uh, the local physician primarily and wherever there is a need there could be further discussion i appreciate that dr shambo has also highlighted importance of patient education and uh, proper counseling proper communication uh, he has mentioned about uh, Uh, education empathy uh, i would add a couple more uh, this thing uh, is one is effectiveness uh, unless the patient is convinced that it is effective uh, patient will stop taking it okay so how why we are trying to explain to the patient we have to also tell them how the patient themselves can gauge whether it is effective or not when should they try to assess self assess that it is effective and what would be the parameters for the so called effectiveness so that before they can take a decision all by themselves to quit this uh, they should at least uh, come back to the physician and uh, have a, a fresh discussion that uh, his expectation or her expectation was this much of effectiveness but the, this didn't occur so the effectiveness is also an issue that should be uh, sufficiently emphasized again another e emphasis emphasis on effectiveness during the uh, during the initial uh, uh, education patient education or the uh, counseling and the last e i would say is the economy uh, the cost of this therapy whether the patient can afford it the economy aspect is also to be kept in mind so to summarize yes education patient education empathy of the treating physician is very important effectiveness ascertaining effectiveness and economy uh, when we say economy we have to keep in mind 
that relative to the cost okay at the face value the cost may be a little higher but then you have to explain to the patient that overall it is going to be otherwise worth the spending this much because this has this much track record so it is expected that it is going to be effective and also ask them that how they can self assess its effectiveness i think uh, that way it is going to really help i just before i leave i just make another point that uh, because it is a long term therapy during this period there is a possibility of other comorbidities the patient may suffer from the patient may think of taking a second opinion and when he goes to the second physician the second physician tries to treat him with some monoclonal antibody there are also some reports in the literature about say uh, omelizumab omelizumab in uh, these patients these types of allergic patients and then there are also uh, studies that have shown pre treatment with omelizumab uh, actually optimizes the safety of allergen immunotherapy so there might be some concern whether we can think of uh, taking omelizumab and uh, this thing simultaneously or uh, pre treated etc so there should not be much of a concern we have some data already etc so i think i think this possibility of interactions okay particularly because it's a long term therapy and also in terms of the long term safety uh, in, in during the initial counseling or discussion this should also be focused otherwise it was a great uh, listening to dr shambhu thank you very much dr shambhu so we can thank go to you, the sir. next next part thank you sir thank you very much sir uh, so we have to move to our next session and it is actually a recorded one because uh, there is some uh, important emergency a uh, thing happened to dr shoival moitro so he had sent me the recorded one recorded uh, uh, video on this topic on allergen immunotherapy evidences for practicing so is my screen is visible rohan yes absolutely it is visible go ahead visible visible yes. so so is it also audible also sir Yes, is audible. Yes, yeah, yeah, audible. One of the most remarkable forms of the treatment of allergic disease. The sound is going down. Dr. Shoival Moitra's voice is not very audible. Dr. Dr. Shambhu, you may consider using these slides and make the presentation on behalf of Dr. Moitra. Another thing, Dr. Shambhu, Dr. Shambhu, if you could go to the share screen option, and you can use an option called use audio. Hello, Rohan, can Hello? you help me yes. how to do this? Yes, yes. Uh, then go to the share screen option. Yeah. and there should be a option for share screen audio oh share sound and optimize for video clip like that yes okay so now i i think you we can hear sorry for this delay okay good evening is, is it audible i would be talking about yes yes, yes. therapy to be quite unique in the armamentarium of an allergist but also it helps in changing the biology of the disease course of the allergic diseases which is not possible by any other means of the treatment as of now so what are the evidence we have for its practice so to introduce we all reiterate 
the same what is allergic therapy the different definition so this allergic therapy for the treatment of the diseases mainly respiratory diseases is now an established modality of treatment worldwide along with the pharmacotherapy and the avoidance measures which has been stated quite well by the world allergy organization the ERK guidelines hence and also various other national and the international guidelines subcutaneous immunotherapy has proven efficacy in allergic rhinoconjunctivitis and asthma and requires regular injections at the clinician's office typically over a period of three to five years the only drawback which we have in the conventional immunotherapy is its long duration of the treatment so this is what it does this is the allergy immunotherapy it has a multi-pronged effect at various levels of our immune system so if you talk about the master cell that is the t lymphocyte it has an effect on the t lymphocytes it decreases the allergen specific proliferation of the lymphocytes it decreases the th2 cytokines namely il4 5 13 released by the th2 cells it increases the th1 cytokines namely i think gamma and increases the t regulatory cells it is production of the inhibitory cytokines, which are the interleukin 10 and the TGF beta. Along with that, the effect on the B lymphocytes, like it causes a decrease in the allergen specific proliferation of the B, B lympho lymphocytes and also the release of the IgE in the serum <coughs> and causes the increased production of the blocking antibodies, namely IgG4 and the mucosal immunoglobulins A. On the dendritic cell, which is the professional antigen presenting cell, it causes the blockage of the CD86 molecule. And CD80 or the 86 molecules, these are the important and molecular ligand for or the other uh, uh, or the other uh, uh, actually uh, the chemical mediators surface bound chemical mediators which are involved in the signal transduction mecha mechanism in an immunological synapse. So namely it is the CD28 or the CTLA4 or, or which is also a ligand of the CD80 or the 86. So the blockade of the CD86 results in the abrogation of the second signaling molecule, second signal in immunological synapse so it does not give that signal to the T cells so that it can proliferate and produce the cytokines and activate the other nearby cells. So it increases the interleukin 10 productions, is the inhibitory cytokines and aids in the development of the regulatory phenotype of the T lymphocytes and also it causes a reduction in the interleukin 12. On the monocytes, it has an effect on the monocyte in the therapy causing release of the interleukin 10 and has a very, very spectacular effect on the mast cells and which has been seen from very early days of the allergen immunotherapy. When the allergen immunotherapy starts, it initially it causes the change in the electrical poten potential of the mast cell cell membrane and this change in the electrical potential of the mast cell membrane, it causes is the less degranulation of the granules in the mast cell cytoplasm. In the eosinophils, it reduces the eosinophil L levels in the tissues and also reduces the release of the pro-inflammatory mediators from the eosinophils, namely the eosinophil cationic proteins, the myeloperoxidase, and other numerous chemical mediators which are released by from the eosinophils and which are actually involved in the allergic inflammation either in the airways or in, in the tissues in which is the cells at home. So what are the clinical outcomes? So it translates into a clinical outcome of the improved quality of life, reduction in the symptoms and the medication requirement which is very very important. So their reduction in the medication usage and namely the medication that we are mainly bothered about is the inhaled corticosteroid and also 
uh, as an objective measurement, there's a reduction in the skin quick test reactivity over a period of time, and which can be seen in the reduction in the number of the sensitizations, which is seen in these patients who are undergoing the allergen immunotherapy. The international consensus on the allergen immunotherapy, it has stated that the mechanism standardization and pharmacoeconomics as in this, uh, in, this is, is a very important interesting treatise, uh, so which is available online, and this shows that the cellular and the molecular changes during allergen immunotherapy, it has an effect not only on the adaptive immunity or the adaptive immune system, but also on the innate immune system. The adaptive immune system effects, effects are so many that you can see that is, as we're talking about, that the uh, increase is the clonal expansion of the Th1 one cells, and then there's a Th2 cells reduction. There is a Th9 cells, though, though this is coming out to be a newer uh, evidence modality uh, or, or effect of the immunotherapy. Tx cells, definitely it's an increase in the production of this. Th22 cells, these are the cells which releases Lots of cytokines are involved in the infl inflammation. TH17 cells, it is immunotherapy causes reduction in TH17 cells and the production of the interleukins like the lipid 17, which is involved in the neutrophilic inflammation of the ARPRs. And also on the B cell, that is the increased production of the blocking antibodies, IgG4, decreased production of the IgE by the plasma cells and formulation of the clone of the B regulatory cells, so the B reg cells in the milieu of the interleukin 10, which is achieved by the allergen immunotherapy. And all this goes to reduce the tissue inflammation. Not only this, it has effect on the innate immune system cells, then the eosinophils, the basophils, the mast cells, the neutrophils, all these are actually, the numbers are reduced following the allergen immunotherapy in a particular tissue. And not only that, now we are getting evidences that allergen immunotherapy has an impact on the epithelial cells, epithelial cells, which are the first barriers as involved in the immune, innate immune defense mechanisms and causes the epithelial cells to reduce less of the alarmins, which are alarm Um, to to produce those as we activation and release of the eosinophil derived chemical mediators. So thus, if we see that this is what I was talking about, that is allergens, toxins, and pollutants which affects the epithelial cells for the release of these alarmins. The, these are uh, the chemical mediators which which signals the productions of the ILC2, which is reduced by the allergen immunotherapy and the innate it's natural killer T T cells, which are also involved in the production of the IL-4 and the IL-13. We know that the innate natural killer T T cells, which are basically, basically the homologues of the T helper cells, cells and, and this of the innate homologue of the T, uh, T helper type, type 1 cells. And basically they are also reduced in cases of the allergen immunotherapy. Uh, when these patients undergo with this. And now we see that this is this schematic diagram shows that how uh, there's then dendritic cells, cells and there is this pattern recognition receptors along with, with, with these epithelial cells or the dendritic cells. They recognize uh, the specific pattern, associated molecular patterns, specific molecular patterns of the allergens and this causes its acti activation and these dendritic cells then, then internalizes the antigen and it actually breaks it down into the smaller peptides and along with the NHC class two, that is an allergic, uh, which is NH2 class two, is along with the NHC class two presents those antigenic epistopes to the naive T cells. These naive T cells, 
when they presented with this MHC class two uh, uh, bound on the antigenic epitopes. Uh, they actually form the TH2 cells in the milieu of the interleukin 4, 5, and 13. And these TH2 cells form the releases interleukin 4, 5, 9, and 13, which, which causes its effect. And these are all reduced by an allergen immunotherapy. So, what is the mechanism of the allergen immunotherapy? It's the immune tolerance. Now, the immune tolerance initially is a rapid desensitization, then there's early tolerance which goes on to the sustained tolerance over a period of several years. This is the rapid desensitization is because of the effector cell desensitization by reduction in the IgG production by the mast cell and the basophil stabilization and reduce formation of the mediators like the histamine C signaling. Long term or sustained tolerance is achieved by the increase in the T regulatory or the B regulatory cells. That is the increase in the TH1, TH2 ratio increase in the IgG4 levels, decrease in the IgE, this decreased tissue inflammation, this decreased mast cells and the eosinophils and their mediators in the tissues, which actually leads on to prolonged sustained tolerance even after stopping the immunotherapy in these patients. So there is lots of trials which has been undertaken globally, which has proved that allergen efficacy the allergen immunotherapy has a proven efficacy, but the agents to which the allergens determine the level of evidence is highest is that of the house dust mite, of the pollens, the moles, the animal well, epithelia, and obviously stingent insect allergy, that is the Hymenoptera venum. For the cockroach, we have a low level of, of the evidence. These are the meta-analysis of the, of the randomized control trials. So factors, there's several factors which increases clinical efficacy of the allergic immunotherapy and which has to be taken into consideration while we are planning to, to start a patient on an immunotherapy or embark on an allergic immunotherapy uh, protocol or the treatment modality in any patient. So the short duration of disease, like early age initiation of AIT in the course of the disease is actually increases the efficacy. There's a minor involvement of the lower airways, definitely if there's mild disease, is that is, is of the asthma, basically, uh, basically we have a better response. The severe disease, we don't intend to start the immunotherapy if the FEV1 is quite low, less than 70% of the predicted. So good compliance and adherence has to be ensured beforehand. Patients should know that this is a long-term treatment which has to be taken for three to five years. So only when they are psychologically, they are prepared, they are well aware that this is a long-term treatment should they be started with this form of treatment. And the high cumulative AIT doses, the efficacy of therapy associated with the dose response curve, which we know now, there is a dose response relationship in the therapy. And so when the cumulative AIT doses becomes increases, high cumulative doses, to increase the efficacy of the immunotherapy. So which we try to achieve in very short period of time by a cluster immunotherapy or, or the rush immunotherapy or the ultra rush immunotherapy. So the EIT guidelines for allergy immunotherapy, that is a house dust might driven allergic asthma. The key points are the patients with the HDM driven allergic asthma, not the HDM situation, but the house dust might should drive the allergy symptoms in these patients. It could be an, an symptoms pertaining to the lungs or it could be symptoms pertaining to the nose. So the HDM driven allergic asthma not adequately controlled on available pharmacotherapy present an unmet health need. So AIT targets the underlying mechanisms in the allergic asthma as we have just shown in the previous, seen in the previous slides by modifying the neurological response to allergen and goes towards an immune tolerance. And how does my allergy immunotherapy may add to the anti-inflammatory action of the inhaled corticosteroid to promote the asthma control and decrease the risk of the exacerbations in these patients, which is very, very important. So the success of the house dust mite immunotherapy in HDM driven allergic asthma is largely dependent on proper selection of patients, which is very, very important. Until unless we, we actually devote time in the selection of the patients, selection of the allergens, and then basically it's going to be a failure. So we need to be very cautious and very, uh, we need to uh, 
we have to be very careful in when we are selecting the patients with the HDM sensitization and symptoms driven by allergen exposure plus the use of the allergen extracts and the proven efficacy of the quality of the allergen. So the selection of the patients, the selection of, of the allergens and, and the quality of the allergens, these three are the key points and so when we have to see the success of this modality. To date, only albinotherapy with HM slit have been demonstrated to show robust with clinical adherence on critical endpoints, but are along with that, that, so that was incorporated into the GINA, but we have many other evidences which subcutaneous immunotherapy has also shown to be quite effective in preventing end exacerbations and ensuring the asthma control. So allergy therapy should only be initiated and monitored by healthcare professionals with the appropriate competences which will require an investment in the training, which is, which is extremely important. This is how it goes as a disease, that is by symptoms, lung function, here we have responsiveness or biomarkers like pheno, like the sputum eosinophils or the blood eosinophils, etc. Then we characterize the allergic phenotype, the history with or without the HDM provocation test. HDM provocation test, we don't have this facility in most of the centers in our country. So it would be different on the history and the other biomarkers. We evaluate the impact of the allergic sensation, asthma symptoms and control. And with the asthma with HDM sensitization, it's only regular control treatment. But if it's a HDM driven allergic asthma symptoms, then only we, we consider HDM AIT added to the regular controller treatment as per the genome guidelines. So what is, what is the integration? How can we integrate the HDM AIT in a stepwise management on, on the HDM driven allergic asthma based on the level of asthma control? It's uncontrolled asthma. We don't start immunotherapy. We achieve the asthma control first and then add the immunotherapy. If it is the partly controlled asthma, we have two options. First, we achieve the asthma control and then start immunotherapy, or we add the immunotherapy to facilitate achieving asthma control. This depends upon on the judgment of the clinician and also or the wish of the patients taken into consideration. For the controlled asthma, definitely HDM, AIT, and decrease, we should add this and it should decrease the control medication with regular assessing for asthma control. Okay, so this is very, very important. So issue is with the compliance. If the patient is taking the sublingual immunotherapy, it depends a commitment by the patient to a long-term daily maintenance therapy that is self-administered. So the compliance issue is equally important to sublingual as it is important for the subcutaneous and the patient must be initiated and they must be aware and they, they must uh, uh, be quite important to make them understand that they have to take this treatment on their own regularly for a long duration of time. So compliance is likely to be lower than the doctor in supervised clinical trials because in the supervised there is someone who is supervising the treatment as in subcutaneous immunotherapy and which ensures the compliance and also it helps to encourage the patient to continue the treatment. And so there has been always this issue with the sublingual immunotherapy of the compliance and a study of 300 children who received either grass or house dust mite sublingual drops or tablets over two hours of treatment revealed that these continuation rates were clearly tied to follow up with this first study size. So you can see the dropout rate was 30%, 68%, and 82% in patients evaluated in the clinic every three, six, and 12 months. Especially. So at the one year, at the end of one year, the dropout rate was 82%. So that means this is one of the major hurdles for sublingual and third continuation. And because the top of it's a very, very high. So this is this can the, the another retrospective analysis of a community pharmacy database of uh, 6,486 patients beginning subcutaneous immunotherapy or subcutaneous immunotherapy. 23% of the subcutaneous immunotherapy completed the patient treatment for three years, but only 7% of the subcutaneous immunotherapy completed the three years treatment. So dropout rates were pretty high in the sublingual immunotherapy, though it is much safer, easier to get administered, safe person can take it safely in their home, but still uh, they are actually, when they become fine and they come out of the medicine, there's no symptom, control is very adequate, they usually tend to drop, drop out of the treatment. So the practical difficulties is very important to understand one, allergen immunotherapy should not be given only on the basis of serological tests 
in vitro test may be used only as supportive test or in situ situations in which skin testing is not possible. So a positive result, whether it's a skin quick test, so it's a specific IgE, does not necessarily mean the symptoms are due to an IgE-related allergy. And therefore, it is important to correlate results with the history and examination findings. And this has been in the, the regular teachings in, in, in our immunotherapy classes that when a patient is, is uh, undergoes this allergy test, whether it's a skin quick test or a specific IG test, then if it's a positive, it shows only sensitization, which is a immunological process. And then a second history has to be taken where uh, the positive aller allergens has to be correlated with the patient's history. Only when we can, only then only we can arrive at a diagnosis that yes, this is the allergen which is causing the clinical allergy or the symptoms in the particular patient. So in summary, the clinical parameters such as symptom score, medication score, or any other scores for that matter, assessment of the quality of life should be considered to assess the response to the immunotherapy. So there's evidence of head-to-head -head comparison subcutaneous versus sublingual immunotherapy. Few studies found that there is it is favoring the sublingual, future is, is favoring the subcutaneous. So it all depends on which is available in a, in a doctor's hand and what is the patient's choice. So for the efficacy of the immunotherapy for the Cochrane reviews, it has shown that in allergen immunotherapy, in all it favors the immunotherapy, uh, either the subcutaneous or the sublingual, both in the allergic rhinitis or in the allergic asthma. So favor is always towards the immunotherapy. So the only thing that we are faced with is that in polysensitized patients. So where sublingual immunotherapy, if you think of giving this, the most compelling data for use of sleep is in monosensitized pediatric or the adult patient with seasonal allergic conjunctivitis with or without mild asthma. So nearly all the high quality studies that are available have shown benefit in this context, but in Indian and also North American populations, we have Poly, polysensitized patients and where uh, basically we need to think of that what the next step should be. First thing is, is that we need to distinguish between the polysensitization and polyallergy. As I have said, sensitization only merely the presence of a positive skin prick test, specific IgE. If it is uh, two or more allergens, we call it polysensitizations. But if it is a clinically confirmed allergy to two or more sensitizing allergens, then we call it polyallergy. So the menan is basically the management of the polyallergic patients, which has been dealt with in a few published review articles. It's important to understand the sensitization allergy profile of a patient can help in allergies provide a specific AIT with a greater confidence. So always we do a test, we find out if it is a polyallergy, if it is a polysensitization. If it is a polyallergy, we then try to uh, come down to the most clinically relevant or the important and actually the allergens which cannot be avoided by the patient in his or her environment and those which can be avoided the patient can avoid and then we can actually be come come down on step step by step in a mono allergen in, in, in the therapy which is actually the best guide for the patients thank you very much uh, uh, for uh, for this hearing and i hope um, that this will help to shed some of of the evidence Thank you, sir. So, I am very sorry for any technical glitch that happened during this presentation. Uh, there was some tech issues happened to Dr. Shwebal Moitra, sir. So, we missed him uh, directly presenting in this platform. But we are really fortunate to have uh, his views on this very important topic and that was an wonderful deliberation so may i request uh, our chairpersons dr orijit dash professor shantanu tripathi professor oshim shankar sir if you have any comment and i think dr toha kureshi uh, may i request dr kureshi to please uh, unmute yourself. Yeah. this was a wonderful yes, session sir. a very good session Shambhu, thank you very much. I thank you all my co-chairperson and all the speakers. It has been a very good experience for every one of us. Uh, so nice.
Now, can I say good night? Okay, sir. Uh, I think Dr. Tawha Pureshi has some comment. So, may I request Dr. Pureshi to please unmute yourself? Yes, sir. Uh, thank you so much for providing me one more opportunity to ask a question. Thank you, Shambhu, sir. No, and, no, please, please, uh, please, sir. Uh, uh, Saibal, sir, uh, good evening. Uh, beautiful lecture, as always. Uh, uh, thank you once again. And, uh, you know, uh, just one thing which came from your, it was probably third slide, probably, uh, that uh, you said that after allergen immunotherapy, we uh, have a uh, this uh, decreased uh, reaction on SPT. Uh, I, I am not very sure whether you said this or uh, I heard this because there was a noise in between uh, in the first few, few slides, slides with me, uh, I mean, in my uh, surroundings. So if uh, I got it right that you said that uh, the uh, SPT response decreases after the immunotherapy, this is something what I have not been able to understand properly ever. Some literature favors it, some doesn't. So. What is your take on this, sir? And and does it really matter if SPT size is reduced or increased after uh, you know, the completion of allergen immunotherapy? Yes, actually, uh, Dr. Kureshi, sir, uh, Shoiban Moitro, sir, is not there right now. Uh, he had sent that video by recording. So, yes, okay. sir has mentioned there that with the progress of allergen immunotherapy, there we all know that there is a reduced sens uh, sensitization by allergens. But the thing is that you had asked how much it is clinically relevant to uh, stop allergen immunotherapy or to continue allergen immunotherapy. That is a question still because there is no uh, evidences suggest that to uh, have some test like this follow-up SPT to uh, detect whether we can continue allergen immunotherapy or not like that. So mainly the completion of allergen immunotherapy should be done uh, as per the clinical uh, symptom score improvement. And there are some biochemical markers. There are uh, biomarkers and also uh, Professor Vedantan has told that Serum IgG4 and Ig ratio like that. But most importantly, what whatever evidence we have, the symptom score reduction is the only thing we can we should do. Uh, yes, S SPT that sensitization may uh, follow up SPT may show some reduced sensitize in, in sensitization, but that is not a marker to say. <laughs> Hey, Kiri, sir, I asked this, you know, I have been practicing allergy since uh, not much of time, since about seven or eight years. And in my clinical experience, what I have seen, I mean, the difficulty with the uh, difficulty with the follow up SPT or the repeat SPT after the, I mean, um, the near completion or completion of uh, allergen immunotherapy course, you know what happens? Uh, for example, in the patient's uh, this symptom score is improved drastically. We feel like we'll stop it. And then the medication score also has improved as well. I hope I'm audible, sir. Yeah, yeah. We okay. So uh, med medication as well as some symptom score has improved and uh, it has come to a level where we, we, we think that we should stop immunotherapy. Now that if we do an SPT in this particular patient, if the SPT reactivity is same or else if the SPT reactivity has even worsened, I mean, the sizes of wheels have increased, in that case, you know, what happens, the patient uh, feels, though despite being improved really drastically, the patient uh, feels, uh, you know, uh, discouraged and the patient feels that he has not been well at all, despite all this, these in shots or all, all the therapy. So that's why I have a little bit of reservation on this in, in I mean, in my part of the, the, the world and with my experience. The other, yeah. the, only, the only advantage, sir, I feel uh, would be to check out for some new sensitization, if at all they have come come up. That's yes. that's the thing. That's my yes. argument. I mean, my point on this. Yes, yes, actually, that is a very important one. That new sensitization we need to check. Uh, from my perspective, I also practicing this allergology from at that center for last seven or eight years, like that, yes. under the mentorship of Dr. Shivan Moitra sir. So we had found this type of thing. What you had mentioned. But when the symptoms are not adequately improved, sometimes what happens 
when we are doing the SPT, we will found some new uh, allergen, new sensitization. And like that, I can say there is some uh, seasonal exacerbation of the symptoms. And uh, initially, the patient was on dust mite uh, skit. But when we check the SPT, and we found some cool and like cyanidone is highly sensitive. So right. we start another shots of that uh, right. cyanidone, specific, uh, yeah, cyanidone specific allergen immunotherapy. Right. And after two to three years, the patient get uh, benefit. So right. that is one area where we can use this method. But as you had rightly mentioned, to see the effectiveness of allergen immunotherapy, it is mostly, mostly, mostly clinical. Right. And Thank that you. That also gives some uh, economic benefits to the patient also. Right. Right. Thank you, sir. Thank I you. Think, for, for I, think, I think this particular question also had some bearing on adherence. It is quite likely the patient, uh, if the patient is, patient feels, patient perceives that there is not adequate uh, symptom control yet. And the patient uh, decides himself or herself to take a second opinion. And the second physician asked for another screen pick test. And there it is found that there is again, uh, the, the, it is showing some kind of positivity to some allergen, either the old allergen or the new allergen or whatever. So uh, I think in the, at the very beginning, when you are starting the treatment, uh, when you are trying to counsel the patients and explain everything to the patient, they are also, you have to be very careful and uh, tell the patient what to expect, what not to expect, what to do, what not to do. And before the patient can think of taking a different decision to come back to you. Developing a rapport with the patient is extremely, extremely important here. And uh, in the same breath, I would say, I don't know whether Dr. Vedantan is there or he has left. No, Vedantan sir has left. Okay. Uh, but then I would say that uh, uh, what what is the guide? What does the guideline say about monitoring the patient in reference to the possible improvement? What is the protocol or what is the guidelines? Yes, that sir. If you start okay. the therapy, yes. if you start the therapy, how do you decide? Okay, uh, what is the optimum duration of allergen immunotherapy that should be continued? And then what would decide that now you can think of withdrawing the treatment or uh, or, or tailoring the dose or readjusting the do dosage schedule or whatever. So what do you say? That regarding the, first of all, the duration, the clear cut guideline says that we have to continue it for three to five years. But for monitoring, there is no scope till date or no well evidence to test for any biochemical uh, parameters to see the effectiveness of the therapy. We need to focus on the symptom score. Number two is the medication score is a very good indirect method to see the improvement with allergen immunotherapy. And that means you, you mean to say that rescue medication. That if no, I, am, I have been, no, I have been. Not only on the rescue medication, but also what we had seen, if a patient of asthma is on in, inhalational corticosteroid, initially the dose of, uh, for, uh, that is budesonide was around 800 microgram. So after one year, we will found that patient is well maintained with budesonide 200 microgram. So the medication no, asthma, no, the, the example of asthma would be more complex because asthma will also require adherence to the other co-medications. And there is not one medication, there are other medications, etc. But if you think of allergic rhinitis, they in allergic, also, in allergic rhinitis, whether, whether you are asking your patient to be only on allergen immunotherapy or you are also advising antihistamine. No, sir. Okay. Actually, when we are starting allergen immunotherapy, it is very important to tell our patient to continue the existing pharmacotherapy. Because, right. because if the patient, sometimes this thing happens, many patients stop the existing pharmacotherapy and there will be exacerbation of the disease. 
Now I understand that allergen immunotherapy, even if you start, it will take its time, okay, in yes. order to show its response. So during this window, you have to continue with uh, the uh, other, other treatment, whatever the patient was getting, the pharmacotherapy. But then the issue is uh, explaining it properly to the patient that uh, don't expect that you start allergen immunotherapy today and within months you will be well off so that you can think of stopping your other, other pharmacotherapy. So that is one point. But then uh, how long the patient should continue? As you have stated that three to five years. Now, how to decide which patient will require three years and which patient will require five years? And, uh, um, and, and, and also facilitating or also ensuring that for such a long time, the patient will remain adherent to your treatment. And in your experience, because you have said that you are practicing for five or seven years, that uh, what is the adherence or non-adherence rate in, in today's time, uh, at least from your personal experience, or uh, Dr. Taha, if he is there still, what is your uh, personal experience, the adherence, treatment adherence? Sir, mostly my experience I can share, it is at around uh, for skid subcutaneous immunotherapy, it is at around 50%. Okay. And for slit sublingual immunotherapy, it is at around 40%. Okay. Like that. So, may I request Dr. Twaha to share his uh, experience? Dr. Kuresi, if you are there, what is your. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm here only. Uh, sir, uh, this uh, is a very, I mean, very interesting thing, uh, interesting question as to the adherence of patients vis-a-vis uh, -vis skit or slit. In case of slit, in our case, the adherence has been absolutely good. Even uh, in COVID times, it didn't affect much, but for the supply, sometimes would uh, get a little exhausted only. That was the issue, otherwise patients would follow. Uh, so in my, this little experience, sir, what I could see that if uh, a proper counseling of patients is done, in the very beginning and uh, obviously with follow-ups as well we have a separate we have a sub, kept a separate counselor for it he we have trained him and he has this this only job of uh, counseling patients regarding the benefits and uh, the uh, process of immunotherapy and all that we focus uh, or, or i mean uh, on that a lot through that counselor that reinforces our this thing so our adherence rate regarding this uh, a skit has been somewhere around 70 percent, but with the uh, slit has been around 90 percent or so. Uh, I work at State Kashmir Institute of Medical Sciences, sir. Uh, Skims, uh, it's a government hospital, it's a tertiary care center, sir. So uh, we have a separate allergy immunology department there. So that this is where the place we work. It's a government hospital, sir. Dr. Shambo and Dr. Puresi, may I may I propose that uh, can we have a small, uh, uh, we can say. Uh, survey among say from our acquaintance only if we can identify say 20 physicians in different parts of the country who are engaged in allergen immunotherapy okay uh, to share their or try to collate their experiences in in terms of adherence and in terms of other issues which can uh, affect adherence yes if we can, if we can make a uh, brief uh, say uh, questionnaire it can yeah. become a study, good study, as well, interesting study, a multi center study. Multi -center study. Let us see. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Yes. We'll get, get Thank back you, to sir. you. I think, I think your yes, yes, is there with uh, Dr. Shambo. We'll uh, get back yes, to sir. You. Dr. Soibel knows me very well. Dr. Yes. Soibel knows. Okay. okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. I have Thank been to you. Kolkata as well. Uh, to drug okay. Okay. Great. Great. Yes. yes, sir. Thank you. Very Thank, much. you sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So I think it has gone quite, uh, quite long. And it's already um, time. I think we should call it a day. And, yes. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. So this was this was in fact the twelfth in the series of our uh, adherence uh, webinars, and uh, we started it from January two thousand twenty-one, and this is December. Every month we had one. So. Uh, I think this, this was the last in the series. And I must thank uh, Dr. Shambo, who has been uh, really very instrumental in, in maintaining the, uh, the, the order and the sequence and uh, very regular 
and it, it has been a great achievement i must say that i know kerry academy has uh, succeeded in making this happen and uh, we are also thinking of collating all those and trying to come out with some kind of uh, document of course all these recordings are also with us we may get back to all the uh, speakers in the different sessions on adherence 12 sessions on adherence and uh, maybe next year by middle of next year we will come out with a, a, a publication on this so yes, i must thank you. all all those who are still present and uh, thank you very much with all your uh, support and cooperation we are uh, get, we, we could get it through these 12 uh, consecutive sessions in 12 months uh, with these few words thanking you again and uh, bidding thank you goodbye i hand over to dr shambhu to say the last word over. thank you sir thank you thank you. it is due to your guidance and mentorship we we got a huge success uh, in this adherence programs so now it is our task to make it documented in paper so hopefully it will be done also under your guidance so thank you all the respected delegates who have attended today's program we are uh, really fortunate to have stalwarts in the field of allergy like professor pk virantan clinical pharmacology like professor shantanu tripathi and dermatology like professor oshim shorkar and allergology one of the very renowned allergist dr arijit das was there and also we are really blessed to have dr shoibal moitra sir so thank you all the delegates now may i request mr rohan tripathi the director of inovo care e academy to uh, say the final concluding remarks thank you so much dr shamans sir not only for tonight but for the entire 12 event 12 Uh, the CME program, the 12 months, 12 month, 12 program challenge that we had decided on ourselves in Jan back in January. Thank you so much because it would not have been possible without your constant and energetic guidance and support. So we come at a, it comes at a very good time. So this is the Christmas Eve. So without uh, standing any further in front of in between. you and your christmas dinners also uh, before going i would uh, like to mention that this uh, initiative of inovol care health of solution to spread uh, awareness regarding adherence medicinal adherence this was done backed by supported by our uh, device that we are building called medpal also known as your personal medicinal helper This is a very low cost device that we are trying to set up IoT enabled to help you know uh, arrive at a very infrastructurally and financially available and usable solution for medicinal adherence. As there is almost no one who does not consume uh, or does not know anyone who consumes significant amount of medications. So, uh, like the thing, uh, one of my favorite lines over. the 12 months that dr shamas that mentioned today also the uh, pill you missed can't help you you can't benefit from a medicine that you did not take so with that final word and with the heartfelt gratitude towards all our speakers over the 12 months and a special thank you to dr shamas that and a very good night to everyone tonight and a very merry christmas from our team i know okay health solution Thank, thank you thank you once again good night good night